Distribution Director, Curves and Colors. Another, full, another wonderfully balanced panel here at Kantipur Conclave. This is the second session, Leveraging Digital Transformation. We'll be talking about the challenges and how we can best move forward and make the most of this opportunity that uh, the digital transformation situation possesses or in Nepal. And without any further delay, I would now like to request Sneha to kindly carry forward with the session. Thank you so much, Sadiksha, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm namaste to all of you. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to moderate this session at the third edition of the Kantipur Conclave. I really look forward to what will hopefully be an engaging discussion with our stellar panelists who are enabling disruption in their, respect, in their respective fields of, uh, fields of expertise. And so please bear with us, even though this is a session after lunch. As Sadiksha reiterated, I would like to encourage all of you in the audience to become a part of the conversation with us today. So please do send us your questions through the Kantipur Conclave app, and I will try and incorporate them into the conversation best possible from my side. I think in a short span of time, um, Nepal has really come a long way. Uh, at the last conclave, I remember, uh, there was a conversation about thinking about the future of digital. And yet now, in the span of less than two years, we're already looking at how we can leverage digital transformation to adapt advanced technology for what we hope will bring sustainable, inclusive, and, and accelerated development. I know Sadiksha has briefly introduced our panelists already, but I would really like to start off by requesting our panelists to share a little bit more about themselves in this context so that before we take the conversation forward, uh, we can all get to know them a little bit better. So if you could share two or three sentences about yourself, please. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Amun Thapa. So uh, I'm the founder and CEO at uh, Sastudil. It's an uh, e-commerce company, uh, a leading homegrown e-commerce company in Nepal. Uh, I also uh, co-manage Kali Sisi, we're into waste management, and Anthropos. Uh, it's, a, it's Nepal's first sunglass company, but uh, it's a uh, for I mean non for profit uh, for profit business model where uh, we work with Tilganga Hospital. So for every tenth pair of uh, sunglasses that we sell, uh, we sponsor the cataract surgery of one patient. So currently we've done uh, more than thousands of uh, surgeries in rural Nepal. So I'm involved in all three companies uh, as of now. Thanks, Aman. Yeah. Hi everyone. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Sanskriti Dable. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Thinkabell Labs. Uh, we're an inclusive edtech startup based in Bangalore, and uh, we develop technology to boost braille literacy among visually impaired children. Uh, so our, uh, for our tech, Annie, is the world's first of its kind uh, self-learning braille tech, and enables <clears throat> boosting fundamental uh, literacy and numeracy in an inclusive manner. Uh, we're across 16 states in India, uh, all 50 states of the US, and uh, Hope to bring the same uh, digital transformation to the education sector in Nepal as well. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sanjeev. Actually, I think uh, I have the like you know person with most uh, mis mixed bag here. So I've been uh, like into once into banking, then transited into totally different world with American University establishment in Southeast Asia in Thailand. So where I was based for about 10 years. So banking to American University, then back to Nepal to establish a banking academy. And then in between, just recently in two and a half years, transited to a fintech company into payment space. So when people ask me, who are you? I call myself a joker in a game of cards. You see joker, that would fit into, you know, like a, Jutpati uh, Mahapani and then some other sequences Mahapani. Sometimes a joker is helpful, sometimes you know, you can't do a game like, you know, without Joker or with Joker. So that's been me, uh, part of largely a Joker, uh, like, you know, with a learning case, quest, life learn, like, you know, lifelong learning experience. So I'm here to share my thoughts on the digital transformation. So looking forward to have a very meaningful interaction. Thank you, Sanjeevji. You said you're the Joker, I'm the king. I'm uh, Siddharth Raja. <laughs> I'm a senior specialist with the World Bank's Digital Development Global Practice, and I'm very honored to be here at this 
very important event. Thank you to the Kantipur group for the invitation. And thank you, Sneh, for moderating. And it's lovely to meet all of you. I think a lot of you know what the World Bank Group does. And of course, we are a very, uh, very proud to be a development partner with Nepal for many years. And I, I could probably share with you that uh, the reason I'm here is, in a sense, a continuation of a long tradition of working closely together between the bank group and Nepal on what you could broadly call as the digital agenda. Our first World Bank project in Nepal about 50 odd years ago was the telecommunications sector development project. And we are now working to help chart and support this country in leaping forward into the future thinking about how digital technologies can really transform the economy, society, and of course, the way that the governments interact with their citizens. And so I'm really proud to be here. Uh, I'm based in Kathmandu. I would love to also continue this conversation with a lot of you down the line. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about yourselves with everybody. I think before we start, I'd like to set a little bit more of the context in which I'd like to ground our conversation forward, because this digital space is a massive one. Um, I think many of you must know in this room, um, in 2019, the government of Nepal also announced its first digital economy strategy, the Digital Nepal Framework, uh, which is a blueprint to help unlock Nepal's potential through a roadmap to not only find innovative ways to solve major, challenge, um, major challenges in a short period, but also hopefully to allow Nepal to engage with the global economy. But I think the COVID-19 pandemic came in between and I personally think the pandemic really taught us to fail fast and to really learn from the failures as we adapted to different digital means to try and connect for work, for healthcare, and for education purposes. We also saw many internet-based businesses um, come up during the span of time, and we can discuss this more with Amun as we go into the discussion. However, I think I'd just like us to reflect a little bit more on the readiness of our region and maybe of our country as we look to harnessing the potential of digital. Kathmandu, as most of you know, is one of the most rapidly urbanizing cities in the context of Nepal. Yet, Nepal is the least urbanized country in the region. Nepal has a very, very high internet penetration rate and mobile penetration rate, and we have a very, very formidable youth population but we also have not fully been able to leverage the potential of what the internet-based economy offers. So in this context, I was hoping that we could anchor our conversation in terms of how can digital transformation be leveraged, especially in this time of this new normal, and as actually Nepal looks towards graduating beyond LDC status, how can we look at developing a sustainable and inclusive development framework while leveraging technology, and if you could also think a bit more about the nuances between innovation and inclusion as we're seeking this opportunity for accelerated growth going forward. Um, so with that, let's just deep dive right into the topic of the hour. Uh, maybe I can start with you, Amun. Um, as somebody who has been an industry disruptor, you started Sosto Deal more than a decade ago, and it is one of the first e-commerce platforms in Nepal. If you could maybe shed some light on how this sector has evolved over time, and if you could particularly touch on the proliferation you see in this post-COVID context. Thank you. Sure, Sneha. <clears throat> um, Sneha, so you mentioned uh, Nepal has one of the highest internet penetration in Southeast Asia, and that's very true. But if we go back not long time back, like let's say 10 years back, in 2011, when Sasta Deal, uh, we started uh, the first, one of the first e-commerce companies in the country, internet penetration in the entire Nepal was just 9%. So if you can imagine, you know, let's just 10 years back, 91% of our country uh, people did not even have access to internet, forget e-commerce and all these innovations. So we've come a long way in just a span of 10, 11 years, and it's been a massive growth today. Internet penetration, I mean, different sources have different data, but it's close to 50%. Uh, very similar to the penetration rate in India and China and other neighboring countries. So uh, definitely we've come a long way. But I'd just like to take you guys back to those starting days. Uh, so when we um, started, you know, Sasto Deal, it's, it was mostly about building the industry versus building the company. Because uh, forget about selling, we first had to educate the government that, you know, internet 
uh, in itself is, is one of the, the most important tools for the country. So we had to convince a lot of people at the government level, uh, at the municipality level, at uh, the private sector level, uh, to establish uh, the ecosystem, uh, not just in terms of e-commerce, but in terms of internet uh, uh, itself. Then came the logistics network that we're still struggling today. Uh, I still remember the first employee that I hired, because I used to do everything on my own, uh, was the, the logistics guy, the, the one who delivers on their motorbike. Uh, he made a condition to me that, you know, one, uh, I would not mention that he was a logistics driver in his, um, what do you call, the employment certificate. And B, uh, he had a girlfriend at the, at the time, and he said, uh, I would also take my girlfriend out while making the deliveries. So I had to say yes to that because nobody in Nepal back then would agree to delivering products, right? So we had to basically start from those kind of uh, activities. So when you went to the vendor, um, online was, so whenever I had to, you know, convince them, you know, you need to sell your products online, they would first start with what online is, what internet is, what e-commerce is, and they'd laugh and send me away, right? So those were the early days. Uh, it was mostly about building the culture. And then today, if you look at it, uh, in Kathmandu, uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Everybody is used to internet. Everybody carries, I think, uh, close to 100% of the people in Kathmandu carries a smartphone. Uh, so that's the kind of penetration that we have in, in Kathmandu. But now, what I see is, outside of Kathmandu, it almost takes me back to those early days. Ki you have to then go there in places like Surkhet and, you know, like those, uh, rural Nepal, and then again the discussion is the same, like what is internet, what is e-commerce. So as a local uh, entrepreneur, my mission today is what we've done for Kathmandu, and not alone, uh, through the help of different partners. We want to do this outside of Kathmandu because the digital divide uh, is, is very big, and especially we saw that in COVID, uh, that people in Kathmandu, especially in the education sector, had access to education, they were staying at home and still being able to, you know, continue with their classes, but in, in rural Nepal, people lost the education for two years, and we could not do anything about it, right? So it's the same thing when it comes to businesses and, and, and other areas. So just to share a few facts, uh, e-commerce uh, is the fastest growing industry in Nepal, is growing at a rate of 150%, so we call it CAGR, uh, so the annual compounding rate. Uh, that's massive. Uh, there's been a study done uh, in the e-commerce uh, segment, what it states is today it's a $100 million SAM, uh, serviceable addressable market. It's going to grow 10x. By 2025, it's going to reach or exceed a billion dollar uh, in terms of the SAM. I'm not talking about the market size, I'm just talking about the serviceable addressable market. So it's a big, big, big industry. Um, the retail segment will definitely come to online. But however, like even if we look at, uh, you know, like the most developed parts of the world, uh, retail will still be the majority chunk. Uh, E-commerce will play a minor role. So I'll, I'll speak more about it uh, when we discuss further. Thing. Thank you so much, Amun, for sharing your experience as a first mover in this, and also for bringing up the very important topic about the potential digital divide that could also happen as cities move forward aggressively, and then maybe the rural areas could get left behind. We will come back to this topic later. Um, from, from you, maybe I'd like to move to uh, Sanjeev Ji um, and talk a little bit about the backbone of the digital payment system. Um, you have actually, as you mentioned, been in, this, in the banking and financial sector for over three decades. And yet, um, what I found really refreshing is that you have this approach to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Um, I'd love to learn more about what role NEPS has played for the digital transformation um, in terms of financial payment space. Uh, thank you. I think um, let me start by, you know, like uh, setting my perspective on the current uh, fintech space in Nepal, particularly, you know, like I think uh, last two years has been a major, like, you know, uh, disruption and the transformation for the payment space in Nepal. First, thanks to the pandemic. Without that, it would not have been possible because on record, uh, in my last role through the academy since 2011, I have been like, you know, kind of advocating for uh, digitization in the digital payment since 2011 to until 2019. But things were moving at a very, very slow and painfully slow paces. But suddenly 2020, March, lockdown, and things changed forever. We supported and actually anchored by the central bank at the leadership role. So governor himself went out uh, as a frontliner uh, to push for the QR and all of that. And we had, like, I mean, we're very fortunate to, in Nepal to have the world-class technology. 
I'm very proud of the kind of the product that we have, F1 Soft, company like F1 Soft, or Khalti, or like, you know, I mean, there's a lot of IME pay, or NCHL, they are the pride of the nation. These are like, you know, the, the any like the technology in payment space as comparable as whether you are in Washington DC or New York or in Mumbai or anywhere in the world. I mean, so we have that kind of the opportunity right here, homegrown technologies, and NIPS is part of, like a small part into the card space, uh, driving the card-based payment technology uh, as a back-end solution pro provider to several leading banks, driving about roughly about 4 million cards that equates to about 40% plus market share. Uh, but traditionally, you think of card as not fully digital. Uh, but in last two years, uh, what we did, the disruption, thanks again to the pandemic, uh, we managed to like digitize the entire card uh, journey experience for the customers. So that is cardless, contactless, tap and pay, like uh, web services. So these are some of the digital journey within the card space. Uh, I mean, um, there's a lot of things happening in Nepal, um, talking about like, you know, uh, into the payment space, uh, also in non-payment space. I think uh, besides the payment, I'd like to go on your first point. You mentioned about uh, digital Nepal framework. So government of Nepal has envisioned a couple of verticals, health, education, energy, finance, agri, you know, like some of these key verticals within the digital Nepal framework. I think uh, out of this, only the finance has really taken, uh, like seen a lot of innovation and disruption and the, you know, like the changes. We need health tech, we need agri-tech, we need more on the tourism side, what, you know, like the digitization can be done with the, you know, um, on that sector, so energy sector, so all these, would connect as a connecting dots and feet, and the payment fintech, I think, would play a central role connecting to all these dots. Because the one thing that we, all of us, do on a daily basis, a very common, since we wake up, the time we go to the bed is make payment, right? So, and how to digitize that payment and stuff is the next like, you know, uh, is discussing. Thank you, Sanjeevji, and thank you for highlighting the need for institutional leadership also to make change, and um, also for bringing up, you know, the eight sectors that the Digital Nepal Framework focuses on. I think I'd like to shift gears a little bit from Nepal and go to our neighboring region of India, where I was born, incidentally, as well. And, um, you know, I just wanted to reflect on some numbers as well. Um, India's e-commerce industry actually is expected to grow by a staggering 84% to $111 billion um, in the next two years. And Amun, I really appreciated some of the statistics you shared about Nepal as well in terms of potential of the e-commerce industry. Um, India's also aiming for an ambitious trillion dollar digital economy by 2025. Now, in this context, uh, I wanted to ask um, Sangskriti, I think the, the whole sort of tech industry has really rapidly scaled up also in the context of India. And um, I think your, your product is also quite innovative as well. So I was wondering if you could share your experience of how your products or product is going beyond boundaries and beyond expectations and how it's helped bring about conversations about a specially abled community to the forefront. Thanks, Nate. Uh, so, <clears throat> I'll give a bit of a background about what exactly we do. Uh, my company, we develop Annie. Annie is uh, the world's first braille learning device. So, it's hardware, software, content, and a whole learning e ecosystem in it. Uh, what has happened uh, it, lately, I mean, the technology was in, you know, the tech development was in progress for the last eight years. I started it uh, while I was still in college. but. Uh, Recently, uh, earlier this year, we were on Shark Tank India, and as you all know, TV is a very mainstream, uh, you know, <clears throat> consumption media, and so something that only uh, 
you know, visually impaired children or their parents or the people around them would care about something like Braille literacy. So Braille literacy all over the world is still in single digit percentages. Even if you go to a country like the US, it's less than 10%. In UK, it's less than 4%. Uh, elsewhere, you don't have statistics, but you can imagine. And literacy being the foundation of education, employability, independence, etc., uh, it has a lot of second order, third order effects. So after the Shark Tank appearance, what happened was Braille literacy, which was you know a very niche topic, suddenly became dinner table conversation. Um, we, uh, you know, one of our students of Annie, uh, who is our brand ambassador now, he uh, this little 11-year-old boy, Prathamesh Sinha, and he's been so captivating uh, that he's managed to make inclusion. Uh, a mainstay in the general consciousness, which is how it should be because <clears throat> especially in a time of great digital transformation, accelerated digital transformation, as the world is seeing uh, during and post the pandemic, it's so critical to have the right principles in place because you don't want to build systems and then realize, oh, these systems don't serve a part of my population or these systems are not designed to meet the needs of some people. So it's very critical to have that lens during the design and deployment of such systems. And that's what, I mean, I've personally been seeing, um, because my company is six years old, but this conversation becoming the mainstay has led to, um, well, accelerated outcomes for blind children, of course, but overall, a better focus on inclusion in general. And within the education sector, uh, for example, India has come out with the national education policy, which mandates inclusive education. So. Um, any child should be able to, you know, get admission in any school, and that's that's the way of the future. And when when you have something, when you have a policy like that, you need the general societal awareness also to back it up, and you need the technology to enable something like that, to enable uh, remote learning for special education. <clears throat> and those are, there there are some challenges that are uh, you know that are only solvable by technology because. There's some things that you can't, you simply cannot scale that fast by uh, training and deploying human resources, etc. But at the same time, for countries like, I mean, in India especially, and I'm sure to a large extent for Nepal as well, it is really critical to ensure that the technology, you know, it's, it's not designed and built in a silo, but with uh, and around all the stakeholders that are involved. So it's, it's, Technology is a very important part, but it's not the only part, and which is why the, the, the social consciousness of inclusion is really critical. And I think the pandemic has played a huge role in sort of increasing that awareness for all of us, because it's forced us to take a hard look at, you know, whom are we serving, whom are we not serving, because ultimately, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, when, when some people are left out of a conversation or of a system design, it is all of us that suffer. It's not just the people that are left out. We are robbed of a rich experience, we are robbed of a complete societal participation, and I think that awareness uh, has, has come due to the pandemic, because it's not that, oh, this country or this part of my city is suffering from the pandemic, but I am isolated and I'm safe. That, that just does not work, something that affects one person affects us all, yeah. and yeah, I think I think uh, due to due to the pandemic and uh, you know recent uh, well mainstream attention on inclusion, we we I, I can see the the future systems being designed in a much more thoughtful, inclusive manner and not as an afterthought. Thanks so much for that, Sanskriti, and thank you for highlighting the importance of how innovation can be leveraged for inclusion. That being the most important and. I think one thing that I found fascinating is in your journey with, um, with Annie as well, I remember seeing a little bit about Prathmesh on YouTube as well. You know, it's interesting how even though technology is the enabler, ultimately we as human beings connect to the human experience. So Prathmesh being at the forefront of what you're doing is really something that is also bringing along a wider understanding of the impact of the work that you're doing. So that's am amazing, thank you. Um, now from, uh, from Sanskriti, I'd like to now maybe talk a little bit more about the region and maybe the world from a slightly larger perspective. Um, we're very lucky to have Siddharth here with us today. And um, 
You know, since we've been having this discussion, um, Siddharth, and you've been working very closely with um, different government uh, leaders and on policy, I wanted to ask you um, if you think the building blocks are in place for Nepal going forward. Um, there's this number that's come up, I think I was reading with the World Economic Forum, that uh, in 2025, um, I think the world will have a hundred trillion dollar digital economy. And do you think Nepal has the building blocks in place to engage in that? Thank you. Uh, let me try to dissect a little bit that very interesting question and uh, talk a little bit about the building blocks. In fact, we have a wonderful panel here because we have a great representation of, you talked a lot about Aman, of the connectivity aspect. Uh, you've talked about transactions, uh, there's a sort of inclusion and capacity uh, that you've referred to. Um, and those are, I think, some of the key elements that need to be in place because if everyone is connected, if everyone has the ability to transact and exchange online, and then of course they have the skills and the awareness of where they should go and how they could use those technologies, then of course that's, that's going to position uh, everyone to take advantage of this wonderful set of technologies in a, in, a, in a positive way. And certainly I think for Nepal, and we've already heard quite a bit, I think uh, there's a lot that's happened in this last, uh, these last few decades where, uh, of course, mobile network coverage has reached almost all parts of the population. Uh, there's still gaps, of course, in who's online in what way, because certainly when you think about the very basic voice telephony versus 4G, and of course now when we're looking at 5G in the near future, there's certainly divides uh, in terms of income, in terms of location, and so on. There's also issues, of course, with regards to the quality of service. So it depends if you're in certain parts of town even, uh, you might see your signal drop on and off. And so there's certainly gaps that have to be overcome in terms of even some of the core infrastructure. And then when you think about the fact that only uh, there's only about 20% of households in the country that actually have a fixed broadband connection compared to, let's say, the rest of the world where the average is about 50% of households. So there's, of course, a gap that needs to be overcome there. And certainly most of that's in the cities. Uh, the good news there, of course, is because of the effort of a lot of the internet service providers in the country, 90% of those connections uh, are actually on fiber. So Nepal has, as I think someone was mentioning, a lot of the technological elements which are exactly the same as they should be in the rest of the world. So there's that basic level of connectivity. It's now a question of how you leapfrog into the future where everyone is connected with high speed connectivity uh, which is affordable and available in a very reliable manner so that businesses, small businesses in the village can engage in say tourism, agriculture and so on sectors. Uh, you can transact uh, efficiently online and so on. So there's a, there's a certain level of connectivity that needs to be uh, still built up. Uh, in terms of the, the financial services, you've talked uh, about this as well. Nepal is super impressive. I mean, there have been times uh, where I've left my home up uh, uh, down the street, rather, I should say, uh, and I've realized that I forgot my wallet at home, and then I remembered that I have my mobile phone and I've been able to just go on with the rest of my day. Uh, please don't tell the traffic police because that meant I didn't have my license with me, but that's a different issue. Uh, but there, there's exactly that kind of great opportunity and innovation that we've seen unfold, and I'm very sure all of you know exactly what I'm referring to. Uh, you've named a number of the, the platforms which exist here. Super impressive. And now I think the whole question is about really integrating this so that international transactions can be made more seamlessly. Uh, there's certainly a lower cost. Uh, inclusion, making sure that those are, again, securely available to more people all over the country and small businesses all over the country. And then I'd just like to touch on skills, of course, to say that, uh, and again, a lot of you here will be working in the media and the IT and the related industries. I've consistently been hearing complaints across the board about the fact that there's a workforce shortage because there's certainly a quality uh, that needs to be improved. There's a quantity that needs to be improved. And certainly the fact that a lot of young Nepalis leave the country to work elsewhere doesn't help. And so there's certainly a skills development and a capacity development agenda that needs to be pursued relentlessly uh, because that's obviously going to set the stage for the workforce as well as the innovators that are going to create and implement these technologies in the country. But the last thing I will say in terms of building blocks that uh, I'd like to touch on is also what we're seeing emerge, and this especially during the pandemic, where this entire issue around the trust ecosystem 
has become more and more important. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, systems, information, data are cyber secure. We want to make sure that personal data is protected and that people have an ability to consent to how their data is used. And so these are, again, ideas that are being discussed in the country, and there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, certainly, it's on the policy agenda for the government as well. And so there's certainly a lot that's happened. There's a lot of conversations that are going on in discussions like these. Uh, but certainly, again, gaps that need to be closed to make sure that everyone everywhere is included, especially given the very specific geographic challenges in Nepal. You go from mean sea level to the highest mountains in the world in 250 kilometers. That's got to pose challenges, and uh, it certainly it makes, for example, rollout of networks more expensive or more complex. Uh, it also creates, of course, these disparities we see in terms of access to markets or information. And so how do we make sure that we can ensure the use of technology to link everyone, no matter where they are, overcoming those geographic boundaries or borders or, or challenges? But then on the other hand, also make sure that, that those uh, challenges don't, again, impose a new divide and create a new divide or continue the old divides that we've seen before. So a lot left to be done, but again, good progress, and uh, I'm, of course, looking forward to the future. Thanks so much, Siddharth, and thank you for helping me connect my next question to Amun. Um, you used the phrase overcoming geographic boundaries, and so I'd like to go back to Amun now on that note. Um, you have a homegrown brand which has recently also um, partnered with Flipkart in India. So I'd love to learn how this partnership enables cross-border transactions and market exchange. And uh, what are some of the obstacles you've seen for Nepal in terms of being engaged in this regional marketplace? Thanks, Neha. Um, I think one thing Nepal always lacked was uh, we were, by geographically, we were always a landlocked country, right? And we didn't have access to port. And that actually was the biggest disadvantage of Nepal even, even today. Uh, but when we look at digital, there's no boundaries. That's the one thing that is our advantage, if, at least for Nepal is. We don't need to now think like Nepal is a landlocked country. I think we can do transactions all over the world. Uh, we can trade all over the world. Uh, we can find customers all over the world sitting in Nepal, in Kathmandu or anywhere uh, across, the, uh, across the country, right? So uh, I chose, I mean, India is a start uh, for us to deal. Uh, we chose India, obviously, by default, uh, more than 70% of our trade happens uh, in India. And uh, thanks to Sanskriti as well, you know, like, <laughs> nothing that you've done for Flipkart, but uh, at least the India and Nepal relation, the celebrity relation, uh, adds a lot of value to that as well. So, uh, but as a Nepali, what we've always been doing is we take empty luggages to India, and we fill it up with saris, kutas, books, and whatnot, and we bring it back, right? The only thing that I'm trying to do is to facilitate this thing that's been going on for decades and decades, uh, vice versa, and make it more easy and transparent for the government and for the local people as well. So um, we uh, were fortunate enough to uh, crack this deal with uh, Flipkart, where currently more than 10,000 uh, of their vendors are being onboarded to a Sustodil platform. Uh, so people in Nepal need not now, you know, like go to India with an empty luggage. Uh, but what we've also been very careful at uh, not doing is we don't want to uh, compete with the local businesses here. So, for example, if there's a brand that's locally available, uh, we're trying very hard not to, you know, duplicate that product, trying to bring it from Flipkart in India directly. Uh, now, the most important thing for us is, and the most challenging thing is, how do we reverse the role? So, the Flipkart thing is already happening. We already have Mintra, and there are a lot of Flipkart brands that are being onboarded, a lot of Indian brands that are being onboarded. But now, how do we take uh, a local SME's product, uh, let's say a Yak cheese uh, out of province one, and distribute it to all over the world? Because Nepal has a brand. Nepali products has a brand. The Everest brand also works all the time. Uh, now we know there's a demand all over the world. So in a way, we're working, and, and I cannot disclose a lot of things, but in a way, we're working with Walmart, uh, which is a Flipkart company, uh, the parent company for Flipkart. And Walmart has presence in, in most of the countries all over the world. So we are, in a way, trying to identify products uh, that can work at scale uh, and, uh, you know, like promote them in, in countries, wherever there's demand. Uh, so, Sneha, the last thing that you asked was the challenge, right? Um, I'll speak about the export challenge. One, uh, as a law of the land, uh, as a Nepali business, we cannot, you know, branch out of Nepal, right? 
uh, it's very difficult for any Nepali entrepreneur to start something outside of Nepal, whereas anybody outside of Nepal can come to Nepal and start their businesses, and we're competing with them. Uh, so that's the biggest uh, challenge that we have as of now. Second, uh, in this Walmart project, uh, we you know, ran into this problem where we could not even identify one single product that they wanted at scale. So for example, Flipkart itself has 400 million users. Um, that's what our 10 times our country's size, right? So whenever we list something, at least it has to be a size of a considerable thing that, you know, like it, it sells to Karod people. We don't have those kind of products uh, at that quality, uh, considering the packaging and the supply chain and everything. So in a way, uh, we're also involving the government of Nepal, so the FMTC that we are also partners with, so that the government then can be the procurement partner and procure at that scale, and then we then uh, do this thing with Flipkart and Walmart. So there's a lot of things happening there. Yeah, that's a fascinating point towards the end there, the challenge of economies of scale that we're facing as well. Um, I think since we're still discussing this cross-border space, I'd like to come to Sanjeevji as well. Um, if you could, I remember when we were having conversations prior to this as well, um, you wanted to also bring up a little bit of the role that technology could play in encouraging cross-border remittance. And so if you could shed a little bit more light on potentially if, um, if by leveraging technology, we could even maybe address a little bit of the deficit in the balance of payments that we're facing. Yeah, yeah certainly we'll do that. But let me also like, you know, um, share my perspective on last inclusion innovation that I thought I should have shared. Um, by whole design of digital financial services is by its definition, by its design, I think the inclusion was in mind. At least uh, from my understanding, if you go back to the AFI, uh, you know, like the Alliance for Financial Inclusion or Maya Declaration, uh, where our central bank is also one of the signatory. So by that default, the countries, a central bank need to drive the DFS vertical as part of a citizen's, like, you know, a basic rights. In this part of the world, at least in Nepal, we say the gas, bus, and kapas. In India, they say roti, kapra, or makan. I think roti, kapra, makan ke baad bhuktan ab. You know, the payment system. Gas, bus, kapas ko satma, bhuktani system has become a, as a right, as a basic necessity. I think so inclusion is that. And the kind of the country that we are into geographically different, you know, like all the that terrain. So one of the vision that I have taken on myself is connecting the far western Darsula, the thinker of Darsula, with the Olang Chungola of Taplejung through the connectivity of, you know, at least digital payment uh, kind of. So the urban people in Kathmandu, if they have access to uh, like this uh, mobile payment device or the card, then the same device or the technology should be seamlessly available to the people at the grassroots level. And then only the inclusion would come into a full circle. I think, uh, and then the, the beauty of that is to connect the uh, entrepreneur, you know, then solve the problem at the migration, migrant labor. And this is where the platform like e-commerce could come, not only to list uh, foreign imported products, but the make in Nepal and made in Nepal, how to, you know, like push that through a digital transformation strategy, both the make in Nepal and made in Nepal. I think there's a huge possibility of connecting all, like, you know, that kind of, those kind of dots. Now coming to cross-border, yes, this has one of the like, you know, it really excites me to see the kind of the opportunity country like Nepal has. I was talking to like, you know, I mean, uh, just one hour before uh, chatting with one of my contact, uh, who is who's tracking uh, technological uh, software sales from Nepal to other part of the world, plus these gig workers based out of Nepal, the young talents, uh, from 20 to about 30 age group, and how much they are ma making money. Uh, these gig workers are making to the tune of minimum to about $3,000 to about $7,000 a month by basing in Kathmandu, and their average age is about 24, 25. And uh, technology, so total kitty, it looks like very unofficial. Nepal is earning about a billion dollar worth of software product sales to other country plus the, you know, the skills. So the gig worker plus these companies, you know, so this is amazing. This is so much like, you know, like, I mean, happening and they are not in the radar. You know, I mean, very interestingly. 
Uh, because uh, we are into that space, sometimes we bump into these young like talents and what they are doing. So now the third, I mean, coming back to your question on this cross border, yes. Let's look at the, I think I was looking at the one World Bank report a couple of years back that was quite an eye opening where it was talking about the remittance movement of like between two countries. And the one report was, one data was really like, you know, kind of shocking yet eye opening. The Nepali laborers and worker working in India sending back home a billion dollar every year. The Indian worker working in Nepal sending back, according to the World Bank, $3 billion. How it is possible? I didn't want to go into that detail. But for me as a payment in the GS, there's a $4 billion worth of market right there into cross-border remittance. So these Nepali workers in India sending back $1 billion home and Indian workers in Nepal sending back $3 $3 billion back home, that's a put together $4 billion worth of cross-border remittance. And both these you know, target audience carry mobile phone in each of their country, and they have some kind of identification number. So what is stopping us of coming up with a solution to that issue so that the more money can move seamlessly between these two countries? Because largely we see these laborers are carrying the money in the form of cash. So I think this is where one disruption uh, can be, you know, like, and it's not a rocket science. Actually, it's a very plain vanilla kind of the product if you look at from the payment space. You know, I mean, uh, there's a, certainly some policies, uh, you know, there's some guideline or some kind of arrangement between uh, two countries uh, that can be made, and I think that's not even complicated. If we can, you know, exchange people, get into marriage relationship, or like into property investment relationship, and uh, like, you know, other stuff. So I think the remittance can be. So there is one, but besides that, think about the trading activity between two countries. So with India, Nepal has the largest trade deficit. I think the World Bank gentleman is right here. So I think, uh, you know, one of our biggest trading partner is India, but the huge gap. You know, the amount I think we're buying at least to the tune of eight to $10 billion worth of goods and services. And forget education and the health, even the insurance, you know, like the pilgrimage. So like, you know, and tourism. So if those money can move through digital channel, take it, we go to India and pay for our education. We go to India, pay for our health. You know, we go to India, pay for our tourism or like, you know, service product. But can we not do that through, you know, like FinTech or payment solution? And that is very much possible. I would like, and as, as I was saying, okay, like we have the world-class product like, you know, phone pay, connect IPS, you know, IME pay or like, you know, all of this. Why cannot I use these payment interfaces in my travel to Mumbai? in my travel to DC, in my travel to Frankfurt, in my travel to Paris, what is stopping us? I mean, then collaboration, the inclusion, or like, you know, in the transformation, I think this is where taking cue from, I think, Siddharth's point and like, I think, uh, Amun's point, digital transformation is the future for Nepal and the opportunity for Nepal. We don't sure. have to start the journey from bullock cart to, you know, go through different stages to get to the spacecraft. The beauty of digital transformation is, you know, like you can ride onto the same level of technology, same quality of technology that people ride in New York or in Washington DC or Frankfurt, or like, you know, Mumbai or in Kathmandu. Yeah. Thank you so, so. much, Sanjeevji. And um, I think you've given us a lot of things to unpack there. Um, as I was listening to you, I was also scanning through some questions that have come in from the audience. Um, in light of time, I feel like maybe it's a good time to bring in some of their perspectives as well. Um, there's an interesting question, actually, which um, is something that Siddharth had also brought up in his conversation. So a question from uh, Manoj Thapa. I'd like to direct to you and any of the panelists, please, if you'd like to add to that question, it'd be amazing. Uh, the question goes, um, in Nepal, when we talk about digital transformation, we seem to talk very less in regard to data sovereign sovereignty and data governance. And um, he would love to learn more about um, this topic from the panelists as well. Sure, this is a very interesting and a very complex topic, of course, uh, something that's becoming more and more uh, 
like let's say mainstream in the conversations that we're having. And I think one of the interesting uh, debates which is unfolding all over the world right now is really about this balance between understanding how data flows, and we've seen this with the internet over the last 50 odd years, that as you allow global data flows to take place, the exchange of information, ideas, access to markets, access to services, exactly the kinds of things you were referring to with finance or with e-commerce. And in fact, even if you think about the opportunities for uh, persons with disabilities, for example, and just to link these things together, you have online workers, uh, persons with disabilities, who are able to work online for international firms, they aren't able to move out of their own homes because of all the mobility restrictions in their own country, but they're able to serve markets elsewhere. So there's a, there's a whole opportunity that opens up because of the fact that you have global data flows. On the other hand, a big challenge which is emerging, it comes from, one on the one hand, the fact that we all know that all of these free services that we are so used to using come at the price of access to our and use of our personal data. And of course, I don't need to explain to this audience, you're quite familiar with this given this, the theme of this entire conference and uh, people in the, in the audience here will know that this is exactly where now the conversation starts uh, developing about who exactly develops and takes the value from that kind of data. And as I mentioned in my earlier comments that it therefore becomes very important to think about the consent architecture. Uh, that allows your data to be used based on your preferences. And you've, begun, you've probably begun to see this every time you go to a, a website or a business that works out of Europe, they are compelled to follow the general data protection regulations, which then is that whole list of the cookies that you select to keep or not keep, and the data that you choose to exchange and so on. So there's, uh, there is a growing recognition of the fact that there needs to be improved control and, and management of the data. On the other hand, of course, there's questions around the public sector as well. The fact that most public institutions and governments do have a huge amount of data. A lot of this is very sensitive. It needs to be protected. And so there's a great case to be made in that, in sort of the public interest there to manage that very carefully. But then there's also a lot of data, whether it's statistics or it's uh, you know, anonymized data, et cetera, which when managed well, and regulated well uh, can actually also be used for innovation and act, used for service delivery. Whether it's in terms of improving the traffic planning or it's in terms of understanding how many kids are going to be enrolling for school or what meals need to be distributed at a time of a crisis. So again, it's not that we have to think of this in a binary sense of yes versus no, but rather in terms of thinking about the different kinds of data, who's using it, who has access to it, what's the value, how is, how is this protected? And in the end, really fundamentally thinking about the fact that it's the people who generate that data who probably should be the ones creating the value out of it or getting the value out of it one way or the other. And so that's the conversation that I think is unfolding. It's complex. I can't obviously answer the full question here, but just to sort of lay out some of those trends and topics and obviously something that is being discussed here in Nepal as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah please add. Thank you. Thanks, Sanskrit. I'd like to share an anecdote about data sovereignty. So I'm an Indian and I was visiting Rwanda last month. And when I went to the hotel, when the guests sign up form, the same GDPR question of I consent or I don't consent to, uh, for my information to be used for marketing, outreach, or whatever it is. And <clears throat> so I'm not a European citizen. I wasn't even visiting Europe. But if any any sort of digital service has to take my data anywhere in the world and they happen to have a presence in Europe, then they have to adhere to those norms. And I think that's the world we live in increasingly where it's, it's a connected world. So something that benefits people in one part of the world benefits us all. So uh, yes, data sovereignty is incredibly important. And I think with respect to what you were saying, Siddharth, in terms of deriving insights and uh, you know, that you can only get from processing and owning your data, that's, that's where uh, I think every country or every entity needs to be self-sufficient in that manner and have their own policies. But as consumers, I think, especially in the digital context and how we experience digital services, it's, you know, one thing that works in, a, in one place, I'm sure it works everywhere. So even any Indian business that has to serve uh, countries all across the world, we're, we're forced to adhere to global standards and that, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. So it, it, that's one of the benefits of... Thanks, thanks for adding that, that anecdote. And 
I'd like to just let Siddharth respond to that very quickly before we yeah, move to the next course, question. In the interest of time. And in fact, just to pick up on that, I think we've talked a lot about the COVID pandemic and we all know we were all tracking global data on the pandemic, right? And that's what really helped us to understand what was going on. We've seen how uh, vaccinations and also the creation of these vaccines has been in a way a global effort. So there is certainly, again, a, a very important balance to be struck between thinking about who's controlling that data and how we share that to be most productive and most useful for the greater good. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Siddharth. There is one more question um, that I'd like to share here with our panelists as well. Um, this is from Sudeep Bhaju. Uh, the weakest link in Nepal's digital transformation process is consumer protection. And because there isn't a proactive regulator or government, the providers are keeping quiet about it. How can this be addressed so that accountability is ensured? So for this question, if I may request maybe Amun and Sanjeevji to unpack it a little bit. We are getting closer to time, so if you could keep it brief, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, so Nepal, I think one of the biggest problems when it comes to policy is uh, there are a lot of policies, but they're not synergized well, right? There's IT policy, there's consumer rights policy. There are a lot of departments. It's almost like in India, if you go from one state to another state, the police wouldn't know. Uh, with the thief is, right? So it's very similar when it comes to customers or consumers. Uh, in, in a lot of aspect, it comes to data. So for example, and I, I say this aloud everywhere, uh, an e-commerce company like Sastudil and Daraz has so much of data on, on customers and consumers that even the banks uh, are scared when we reveal that, you know, like we carry all this kind of data. Nobody has come to me from the government or from private sector or from even the public saying, you know, like, just tell me what kind of data do you have on me. Uh, there's a reason India banned TikTok, right? In Nepal, TikTok is the most used uh, platform. Uh, we're sharing all kinds of data as, as uh, all of the panelists mentioned, right? So when it comes to consumer rights, not just with data, also like in e-commerce, one of the biggest challenges is who owns the product. Yesterday, there was a big case uh, at Sustadil itself. Uh, somebody uh, wanted to return the washing machine, uh, which cost uh, almost a lakh rupee. The vendor wouldn't take it back. The customer is at my office um, saying, you know, like, it's your responsibility because I bought it from your platform. Uh, we have an agreement with the vendor saying, you know, like, uh, if, you, the, if there's a warranty, you have to abide by it. Um, but these kind of conflict, then it goes to court. Uh, a lot of times, Sasil and Daraz has been at court uh, handling these kind of petty issues. So even these kind of petty issues is not addressed at the you know, highest level. Uh, there's an e-commerce policy that has been drafted, uh, it's been drafted for the last three years now. And every time there's a new government, they start from the scratch, right? Uh, to be honest, uh, there isn't even an e-commerce industry in Nepal as of now. Uh, companies like Patao and Tutol and all of these companies entering Nepal with a lot of innovative products. They don't know what to do, you know, like, uh, so it's the same with companies, the same with consumers. I think here, um, it always starts with the government. The government will have to intervene and they'll have to start, you know, synergizing all these policies that they already have in place. If you could keep it to one minute, please, Sanjeev. Sorry? If you could oh, take one yeah, minute. Please. I think uh, from the payment sector or finance sector, I think the, I mean, uh, data is one very sensitive issue. Uh, my company churns out uh, close to a million data every day. And my biggest challenge is to, because those data belongs not to me, but to my member banks. So, and where I have to invest, you know, like storing those data, uh, like, you know, very secured, like, you know, PCI, DSS compliant environment, you know, blah, 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 whatever. But I think uh, banking industry is very, like, you know, kind of sensitive at least. And because of thanks to the regulator, where uh, these data is, uh, financial data of every consumer is like must be protected in the way manner that it should be protected. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of like room for improvement. Um, the data is number one in Nepal. There's a lot of data. Let's say, for example, health sector. So a lot of sensitive data are there, but I mean, I don't know how the regulator of the health sector are managing if those data are protected well enough. And, um, but in the finance sector, I think the regulator are pretty stringent and they have laid out procedures. But one opportunity, I think, from my like, perspective, uh, in Nepal, the data's, data are not monetized. So in my company, because we have like, you know, several millions data, we churn out a million data every day, that means those data could give me a lot of pointers to get it monetized uh, from different perspective. So we are also looking at that. Uh, but cyber security, 
you know, is a major challenge, the protection of data from many different perspectives. The cyber threat or theft is a looming challenge, even the, you know, like, uh, um, even if you invest billions of dollars in protecting yourself, no one is immune. So that is the biggest challenge. I think this is a collective, uh, you know, a fight or where we all have to regulate us, the government, the private sector, the industry, the people will have to come together to fight at least from the data protection uh, perspective. Yeah, thanks for that, Sanjeevji, and thanks for that question from the audience. I think data is definitely a double-edged sword. Um, there's an opportunity there, but if not managed well, I think it too has its pitfalls. Um, I would, I think, now like to try and maybe wrap up our conversation a little bit with um, maybe one last question to all the panelists for your closing remarks as well. Um, I think as we think about leveraging digital transformation, uh, we've heard about um, the need for infrastructure, the need for connectivity as well. But I was wondering, in your respective fields, um, have you felt that we also maybe need a stronger shift in mindset or maybe a cultural transformation to be able to successfully leverage technology for inclusive growth? So if we could hear from each of the panelists, and this would be your um, concluding remarks, please. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thanks, Nate. I actually think that it's not an either or. Those, both of those things, building the frameworks, like. Sanjeev said the roti, kapra, makan, bhuktan, and I think connectivity. Um, that's, the, that's the framework, that's the engine you're building. But you also have to generate your fuel, which is your people and your skilling and your mindset shift, and you can't do one without the other. Both of them have to work in tandem. And th yeah, it's, it, I, I don't think it's a either or at all. Thanks. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think as a closing remark, I'll just like to, you know, Tell that we have to be really careful not to disturb the ecosystem uh, while trying to innovate. For example, in Kali CC, um, instead of you know hiring our own vans and trucks, uh, we worked with a network of 13,000 waste workers, and we just empower and enable them through technology. So we're not intervening or disturbing the ecosystem. And every time when we bring up new solutions, we have to think not to disturb the existing ecosystem. I think that that would be my closing remark. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, from my perspective, I think, you know, with the whole digital transformation, what we have seen, and I'm really excited about it because, you know, the kind of the impact it has created. Let's say e-com or the payment space, fintech space. Like, I'm into fintech space for the last few years, and the kind of the empowerment, the space, the fintech, this technology has created for the arm admi, from the ground level people, the bhuhi manse bansa, I mean, Nepalma. So for them, like, the empowerment through a payment is a click of their fingerprints, whether you are based out of Olang Chungola in Taplejung or Tinker in Darsula. You are able to make payment provided there's a connectivity, you know, through your mobile phone device. How powerful it can get. Think about it. And how impactful it is for the base level economy. So the whole this digital transformation is to profit, you know, like whatever we're talking about digital economy transformation, all of that. Like, I mean, this is the empowerment, this is the inclusion, this is the disruption, this is the transformation, at least from my perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjeev Ji. Let me slightly hijack the mindset question and uh, talk a bit about one of the things that I really feel has made a difference all over the world when it comes to the digital transformation agenda. You all heard about PPPs. I'd like to talk about a PPPP, which is a public-private people partnership. And one of the things that really is needed, I think, uh, when you think about a digital transformation which really embeds everything in government, business, uh, just general society, is you, you want a good policy framework, you want the private sector to be part of that conversation, invest, have that sort of enabling environment, you want the people to have the skills, the capabilities, and the trust in the ecosystem to be able to get into that conversation and also voice their concerns and have agency within that to affect change. So th that kind of a partnership, with, I think that, that is what really needs the mindset change, really thinking about how we bring these different constituencies together to create a whole of nation approach to the digital transformation rather than something that's just you know, driven by one or the other constituency. So that, that would be the mindset change I would like to see. Thank you. Thank you so much for summing that up very articulately, uh, Siddharth, as well. I think, um, I think one of the biggest learnings and takeaways from this discussion here today is that multi-stakeholder engagement and collaboration is really required for 
impactful change going forward in this sector. Um, I think with that, uh, everybody, thank you so much for your time and attention. I wish all of you a disruptive conclave ahead. Um, I'd like to thank the Kantipur Media Group and all of the organizers for having us. Um, thank you for such a riveting discussion as well, Aman, Sanskriti, Sanjeev, and Siddharth. Um, hopefully you've learned as much as me or more than me from our panel, and I hope that you will continue to keep this dialogue going for more impactful action as we try and harness the potential of digital going forward for inclusive innovation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our fabulous moderator and all our panelists for this great session on leveraging digital transformation. We talked about inclusive transformation. We talked about the necessary infrastructure, connectivity, and uh, can we have a big round of applause one more time for this fabulous panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We would now like to begin our next session here at Kantepur Conclave 2022. You're watching us live via Kantepur Television HD, Kantepur Cineplex, e Kantepur, And we would also like to go ahead and thank our sponsors one more time for their valuable contribution towards this conclave as well. We'd like to thank our title sponsors, NIC Asia, powered by Asian Paints, our hospitality partner, Hyatt Regency, where we're having this two-day conference, our international airlines partner, Cathay Pacific, our education partner, Uniglobe College, home appliance partner, Haya, e-commerce partner, Daraj, green mobility partner, BYD, insurance partner, Shikhar Insurance, and knowledge partner, BEAD. So ladies and gentlemen, we are done with two sessions here at Kantipur Conclave 2022, and we are moving next to our third session, which is going to be very, very interesting. The title